Chapter One of That Affair at Portstead Manor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. Chapter One All on Account of a Necklace. The chances are that had the Honourable Archibald Clavering suspected what adventures would befall him at Portstead Manor, and what a sorry figure he would present in most of them, he would never have left his correct bachelor chambers in Mayfair to join Lady Ursula's house-party held in the ancestral home of the Sylvesters. Portstead Manor was one of the finest old Elizabethan houses in England, a great, rambling, irregular structure of carven oak and painted plaster, with towers and turrets, gabled roofs, ivy festooned chimneys and quaintly projecting upper stories round about the mansion stretched lawns and terraces and wonderful gardens encircled by a vast park of noble old trees in the midst of which was a large lake where the limpid-eyed deer came to drink beyond were acres of rich meadowlands bordered by dense dark woods an abode of historic interest and placid charm was portstead manor and the last place in the world where one would expect to meet mystery and tragedy it all began with lady pevensey insisting upon sending to town for a priceless family heirloom in the shape of a magnificent diamond necklace with this she meant to dazzle the eyes of portstead gentry at the first ball held there since the manor was given to lady ursula by her brother at the time he came into his title that was over ten years ago when lady ursula remonstrated with her guests for running such a risk so needlessly lady pevensey replied that she should feel perfectly safe with the necklace since mr clavering was of the party now the honourable archibald was a disciple of sherlock holmes in an amateur and theoretic way that is he understood that remarkable person's methods but had never had opportunity to put them into practice this tribute to his latent detective powers flattered him and moreover as he was plagued by a tender sentiment for the payer of it he was at once set on his mettle and assured lady pevensey that she could wear the necklace with absolute security so good of you dear mr clavering she exclaimed with a gushing enthusiasm that advancing years she owned to forty-five could not quench otherwise i should almost feel obliged to have a detective down to watch it it is really a great responsibility the necklace arrived on the afternoon of the day the ball was to be held it was guarded on the journey by lady pevensey's family solicitor and her companion mary gray lady pevensey apologized to her hostess for introducing mary gray into the household but declared that the girl was indispensable to her why i did not know that you had a companion remarked lady ursula in surprise oh i haven't had her long and lady pevensey changed the subject now that the necklace had arrived mr clavering felt to the full the responsibility of his position as guardian of its safety he saw it borne upstairs in impressive state by lady pevensey attended by mary gray and he then decided, in the bare event of anything untoward happening, that it would be just as well for him to become somewhat acquainted with the habits of the household. In view of what did happen, he later took no little credit to himself for this foresight. His fellow guests he passed by with scarcely a thought. They were well known to him, and let it be confessed, Mr. Clavering had the failing of most amateur detectives. He could not see beyond preconceived opinions. Trouble, then, if there should be any, must come from the servants the staff of servants was remarkably small for so large a house as portstead but then it was a distinct innovation for the manor to be open to guests lady ursula had always kept her town house for such gatherings and her country residence merely as lady pevensey put it as a shelter for broken-down old servants she had only opened it now at the urgency of her brother the earl of portstead before leaving for what was believed to be a secret diplomatic mission although he called it a pleasure trip down the nile had wished to spend a few days with friends at portstead manor his sister had yielded to his wishes she generally did on this occasion she had increased the staff of servants by a butler three footmen and two under housemaids the others were real old family pensioners and from what the head gardener told mr clavering resented the intrusion of guests and more than all of the new servants mr clavering also learned from the gardener that the new butler had departed that morning after two days service and without giving notice that accounted then for his absence at luncheon and for lady ursula's worried and distraught manner mr clavering had taken particular notice of thompson the butler 
there was a smouldering fire in the fellow's black eyes which belied the impassivity of the british servant and he obviously chafed at receiving orders evidently a man who has seen better days was mr clavering's inward comment moreover there was a hint of something familiar in the thin dark frowning visage of thompson where and under what circumstances had he met this man before after dinner and before the portstead gentry began to arrive for the ball mr clavering went down the circular stairs from the west wing into the great vaulted library for a half hour's contemplation this sombrely splendid apartment with its deep leaded windows its massive carven furniture and its darkly wainscoted walls lined with bookshelves reaching to the ceiling had not been prepared for the coming guests and was illuminated only by a few softly burning tapers whose shadowed light had a soothing effect upon mr clavering's excited nerves although he would not admit it even to himself his responsibility was beginning to weigh upon him in books at least diamond necklaces had such a deucedly unpleasant way of disappearing he had several such cases in mind and was laboriously recalling the manner of their recovery when mary gray glided into the room and passing quickly to the outer door went down into the gardens mr clavering looked after her with interest she was a young woman of perhaps twenty-eight or nine tall and slender with brown hair simply coiled in her neck large brown eyes and a very pale face she wore a simple gown of soft clinging grey indeed simplicity was the keynote of her appearance a studied simplicity mr clavering decided but he mentally pronounced her attractive and was about to stroll into the gardens the moon was just silvering the trees of the park when lady pevensey rushed down the circular stairs in a state of violent hysterics so violent that her negligee was flying open and her switch loosened at one end bobbing wildly over her powdered nose the necklace mr clavering she fairly screamed the necklace has been stolen what he gasped leaping to his feet his great opportunity had suddenly come end of chapter one chapter two of that affair at portstead manor by gladys edson locke this librivox recording is in the public domain mr clavering takes the field lady ursula had followed lady pevensey down the stairs her face was quite as white as her guests but it cannot be stolen she was persisting with an hysterical pitch to her well-bred voice you must have mislaid it one does not mislay diamond necklaces worth a king's ransom retorted lady pevensey angrily i tell you it has been stolen i locked it in my dressing-table drawer mary gray and parkins watched me do it then i put the key inside well i tied it around my neck parkins went to prepare my bath and mary gray went downstairs into the gardens i think she had a headache so she said i was sitting with my eyes glued on the dressing-table drawer I had a presentiment something was going to happen to that necklace when there came a knock on the door i opened it but there was nobody there just your note lying on the floor lady ursula stared at her in blank amazement my note what on earth are you talking about talking about have you lost your memory snapped lady pevensey with a vehemence worthy of a billingsgate fishwife you seem not only to have forgotten the important matter you had to tell me but now you don't even remember your note asking me to come at once to your dressing-room lady ursula's amazement deepened but i wrote you no note she protested here mr clavering with a professional air stepped between the two excited ladies there appears to be a double mystery here have you this note lady pevensey she held out a crumpled bit of paper but i don't care anything about this she cried petulantly i want my necklace found where's mary gray then lady ursula did a strange thing before mr clavering could open the note she snatched it from his hand and tore it into threads well really he began bristling with indignation you have very likely destroyed a valuable clue lady pevensey whirled upon him with increasing hysteria archibald clavering don't stand there talking of clues that you don't know anything about do something find mary gray if you can't do any more with ominous dignity mr clavering advanced to the garden door forgive me mr clavering burst forth lady ursula impulsively i did not know what i was doing i the loss of the necklace has completely upset me pray don't mention it lady ursula he returned stiffly you are not the only one who is upset his glance as it rested on lady pevensey spoke volumes 
At that moment, Mary Gray stepped through the doorway. There was a slight flush on her pale face, and her eyes were very brilliant. Lady Pevensey ran towards her. "'The necklace has been stolen!' she proclaimed with hysterical wrath. Mary Gray stopped short, staring at her. "'Do you hear?' demanded Lady Pevensey shrilly. "'The necklace has been stolen!' "'I hear you, Lady Pevensey,' replied Mary Gray in her quiet voice, and brushing by her, went swiftly up the stairs. "'Well, of all the—' gasped Lady Pevensey. But Mr. Clavering interrupted with a question. His mind had been working quickly. He scented a clue. "'Did you go to Lady Ursula's dressing-room?' "'Certainly, but she was not there. I thought it was strange, and hurried back to my own room, thinking I might have misread the letter. I found the dressing-table drawer open, and the necklace gone.' "'Had the lock been forced?' he asked eagerly. "'Of course it had. Do you think the necklace walked through the keyhole?' Mr. Clavering grew red in an effort to swallow his indignation. "'At just what time was this?' he persisted. But Lady Pevensey's loss had put her in a most abominable temper. "'For heaven's sake, don't ask such silly questions. Of course it wasn't more than ten minutes ago.' "'If I am to assist you in the recovery of your necklace, Lady Pevensey,' observed Mr. Clavering in his stiffest manner, "'it will be necessary for me to ask you certain questions.' "'To tell you the truth, Mr. Clavering,' she flamed, with quite brutal frankness, "'I hardly think you will be of the slightest assistance in recovering the necklace.' Wherewith she fled up the stairs, sobbing dismally. Mr. Clavering was now fairly apoplectic. Lady Ursula laid a soothing hand on his arm. "'Don't notice her, Mr. Clavering. She is too unstrung to realize what she is saying. When she is calmer, I am sure she will not only beg your pardon, but ask your assistance in recovering the necklace. She really has a high opinion of your detective powers,' she added, in what was, perhaps, more a spirit of kindliness than of conviction." But Mr. Clavering did not take it in this way. He brightened perceptibly. "'You think so?' "'Did she not say as much before us all?' Lady Ursula evaded with a faint smile. "'So she did,' he assented. And his self-esteem, restored, began to follow the clue again by questioning Lady Ursula as to where she was when Lady Pevensey went to her room. "'With my brother,' she answered vaguely. "'I should like to know if your maid was in the room, then,' pondered Mr. Clavering." my maid a startled look flashed over her features i don't know i am sure it is quite likely i left her there when i went to my brother is your maid a reliable person rose reliable she echoed slowly her eyes darkened and it seemed to mr clavering that her beautiful face hardened rose is reliable in the ordinary sense of the word she said at length in a cold voice she would not steal i have never missed so much as a handkerchief in the three years that she has been with me. Surely you do not suspect her? In a case like this it is well to suspect everyone, till they are proved innocent, observed Mr. Clavering, with the wisdom born of long study. If you do not object, I should like to question this girl. Oh, I do not object. Yet there was a curious note of constraint in her voice. Ringing, she requested that Rose be sent down to the library. The footman was gone some time, when he returned, his impassivity was manifestly shaken. "'Rose is not to be found, my lady.' "'You mean she is not in my room?' "'She is not in the house, my lady,' dropping an H in his agitation. "'Ah!' murmured Mr. Clavering significantly. "'Rose, gone!' ejaculated Lady Ursula in a tone of horror, and rushed excitedly up the stairs. Mr. Clavering hastened after, but instead of following her to her room, turned into the east wing and went on to Lady Pevensey's. Observing that the door was open, he approached and asked, rather timidly, if he might enter, and see if there were any clues to be discovered. Lady Pevensey had recovered her temper, also settled her switch, so she not only granted him permission to search for clues, but even murmured an apology for her former tartness. Mr. Clavering accepted it magnanimously, and remarked with gallantry that he should never rest till he saw the necklace sparkling about her throat. As he entered the room, Mary Gray passed out. Their eyes met, and the expression in hers was baffling, a half-mocking defiance, so he read it. A curious young woman, he mused, and made up his mind to observe her more closely. To his chagrin, he was able to discover no clues in the room, nothing in any way bearing upon the mystery, save the open and empty dressing-table drawer. The lock had been neatly forced by some burglar's implement, which was missing. As the diamond-paned windows looked down upon the terrace 
with a sheer drop of thirty feet, the thief must have entered by the door. In fact, he was probably concealed in the hall or some nearby chamber, waiting his chance, for although to reach the west wing, where was Lady Ursula's room, Lady Pevensey had been obliged to traverse the long main corridor, she declared that she had not been gone over ten minutes at the most. In lieu of questioning Rose, Mr. Clavering insisted upon interviewing Lady Pevensey's elderly maid Parkins, but to all appearance she was as innocent of the theft as her mistress. Moreover, it was to her that Lady Pevensey had first announced her loss, and she had found her diligently preparing the bath. So Mr. Clavering, perforce, mentally crossed Parkins off the list of suspects, but underscored the name of Mary Gray. "'Did you?' he inquired of Lady Pevensey. "'Notice when you stepped into the hall that any door near yours was ajar?' "'Mercy me!' she shivered. "'Do you think that the thief was hiding in one of the guest rooms, watching for me to go out?' "'It is quite likely,' he responded impressively. Lady Pevensey was duly appalled, and Mr. Clavering found difficulty in calming her sufficiently so that she might answer his question. He finally learned that she had observed one door ajar, the one directly opposite hers, Lord Meldrum's. "'But he was there himself,' she asserted excitedly. "'He looked up as I opened my door. When I came back, his was shut. It has been shut ever since.' Mr. Clavering felt that he must abandon the clue of doors ajar. It was hardly possible to suspect Lord Meldrum, reputed one of the wealthiest peers in the kingdom, of connivance in the theft of the necklace. So he went back to the evolving of his first clue. Lady Ursula's maid had not disappeared without cause, and it was altogether probable that she was the deliverer of the decoy note, if not the actual thief. Suddenly he remembered that the torn shreds of that note were even now lying upon the library floor where Lady Ursula's nervous fingers had flung them. The piecing together of those torn shreds might be his first step in the unraveling of this mystery. But when he reached the library, not a scrap of the note was to be found. He even got down on his knees in his immaculate evening clothes and peered under every article of furniture in the vain hope that a breeze from the open garden door had blown the bits of paper about. "'Have you lost something, Mr. Clavering?' suddenly asked a soft voice with just the faintest suggestion of mockery mr clavering hastily raised his flushed and perspiring face from the dusty depths beneath the escritoire mary gray stood smiling in the garden doorway as she repeated her question mr clavering rose to his feet with what dignity he could and with his handkerchief carefully flecked the dust from the knees of his trousers he was aware that his position had been a very ungraceful one for a man of his standing and years, and it pleased him still less that this cool, self-possessed young woman, whose every glance, at once angered and attracted him, should have discovered him at such a disadvantage. Worse than all, his hitherto always immaculate collar was actually wilted under the stress of his detective zeal. Archibald Clavering, the acknowledged Beau Brummel of the Portsmouth Manor house party, for the first time in his life blushed at himself, one thing only comforted him. Lady Pevensey was not there. To hide his embarrassment, he assumed a pompously stern air. I was searching, Miss Gray, for a letter which I had reason to believe I left here. Under the escritoire? she queried sweetly. Mr. Clavering was a gentleman, and he restrained himself. Letters have been known to drop, he returned, acidly dignified. Quite so, she assented, and with another smile was gone. Mr. Clavering walked rapidly to the bell-rope, and when the footman appeared, once again his impassive self, he bade him find out if any of the maids had recently removed torn bits of paper from the library floor. The report of the inquiry was that no one of the maids had entered the library since dinner. Mr. Clavering was not surprised. Decidedly, Mary Gray required watching. End of chapter 2《 Chapter Three of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Where had Meldrum been? The ball was not a success. Lady Ursula, always so gracious a hostess, was abstracted and nervous. Her brother's chilling remoteness of manner had never been more noticeable. Lady Pevensey remained in her room, nursing a sick headache while Lord Meldrum had suddenly been called to the city, though the time of his departure and the reason for it formed another of the mysteries that troubled Mr. Clavering. 
he was simply gone and would be back before the ball ended that was all the explanation lady ursula vouchsafed that it did not satisfy her brother was apparent and mr clavering suspected that politics in which the earl of portstead and meldrum held radically different opinions were at the bottom of this sudden absence mr clavering was one of those who did not believe that portstead's impending trip to egypt was solely for pleasure portstead had never been one to set aside time for pleasure work untiring and ceaseless was his principle of life and he had an open contempt for those who thought otherwise nothing short of a complete breakdown had sent him to the manor for a few days rest before sailing mr clavering knew that meldrum looked with little favor on portstead's egyptian trip and if it were the government matter he believed it to be meldrum would naturally oppose it the fact that portstead had brought his secretary to the manor and intended taking him to egypt strengthened mr clavering's belief moreover he noticed that the cold politeness with which portstead and meldrum treated one another when they were brought together socially was now verging on open hostility there seemed also a growing breach between portstead and his sister the earl had always frowned on her friendship with meldrum who had frankly been in love with her for years she was generally believed to return his affection and the only apparent obstacle to their marriage was portstead's opposition lady ursula had long been strangely submissive to her brother's wishes though as a girl she had been too high-spirited to brook restraint even from her father who had died while she was travelling on the continent without expressing a wish that his only daughter should come to his bedside a hard old man had the late earl been and his heir was singularly like him in his cold and rigid morality which made him so severe a judge of the faults of others notably those of his brother robert sylvester who had been going the pace for some years now altogether the air of the manor was charged with unpleasantness which affected every one and the ball ended early to the relief of all meldrum had not yet returned lady pevensey in a very despondent mood came downstairs with mary gray when the last guest had departed portstead called a sort of court of inquiry in the sombre great library to determine the best means of recovering the necklace he strongly advised telegraphing to scotland yard for a detective and expressed surprise and disapproval that it had not already been done mr clavering felt highly indignant at this advice portstead evidently did not in the least appreciate his efforts or have faith in his ability mr clavering had never been drawn to portstead the earl had always let him clearly understand that he regarded his life of bachelor ease on a comfortable income as a mere butterfly existence without aim or excuse for being while lady pevensey was appealing to lady ursula as to whether she should or should not send to scotland yard mary gray unexpectedly spoke a word in mr clavering's favour why should lady pevensey need a detective when mr clavering is here and trying his utmost to recover the necklace do you not agree with me lady pevensey she looked at her earnestly as she spoke why why yes of course lady pevensey answered flurriedly flattered though mr clavering was he yet had enough of the true detective in him to watch how the others received mary gray's unsolicited and rather officious advice lady ursula showed barely concealed relief and her brother after a quick glance had passed between them something approaching the same while lady pevensey usually with such positive ideas of her own received it with unquestioning submissiveness it would almost seem that mary gray had some secret hold over her for once before earlier in the evening mr clavering had observed the girl override her opinions in highly authoritative manner if i were you aunt louisa spoke up pretty fair-haired elsie baring who had once been reportedly engaged to robert sylvester i should send for that woman detective mercedes quero all london is talking about her since the dexter case i am sure that mr clavering she added mischievously would not mind working in conjunction with her not at all he replied rather stiffly if lady pevensey thinks it advisable to send for her lady pevensey opened her mouth as though to say something but catching mary gray's eye preserved silence i have no confidence in a woman detective remarked lord portstead in his decisive manner women are not at all suited to detective work they are illogical and carried away by sentiment pray spare us an enumeration of women's failings cecil 
interrupted Lady Ursula wearily. Portstead transfixed her with his cold grey eye. You, Ursula, have frequently proven the truth of my criticism of women. Lady Ursula, flushing angrily, precipitately left the room, muttering something under her breath. Ungenerous, it sounded like to Mr. Clavering. Come, Mr. Clavering, can you not defend us poor women? exclaimed Mrs. Neville West, shaking her fan reprovingly at Lord Portstead, who stood looking after his sister with grimly set face. I could do nothing other than defend you, my dear madam, he returned, with a hint of early Victorian gallantry, because I know nothing but good of you. But neither this nor Mrs. Neville West's sallies could remove the constraint Portstead had caused, and all, save Mr. Clavering, were glad to escape to their rooms. He was too full of clues to think of sleep. Sitting down in the library, he went over what he had in hand. He eliminated from his list of suspects all the servants save the runaway Rose. The butler had been gone several hours before the necklace had even been brought into the house, so he need not be considered. It was a thing impossible to suspect any of his fellow guests, all people of the best standing. Lady Pevensey's nephew and niece, Walter and Elsie Baring, Colonel Darrell, a hero of the first Egyptian campaign, and his wife, Mrs. Neville West, and her ward, Beatrice Knollys, Sir Gerald Leslie, an admirer of Elsie Baring, and Lord Meldrum. Strange what had sent Lord Meldrum away in such haste. Meldrum, ridiculous. Politics, of course. But politics or not, he was an unconscionably long time in returning. Now that Mr. Clavering thought of it, he remembered to have heard the whistle of the last train from the city a good hour ago. Where was Meldrum? Unable to answer this question, and angered by the persistence with which it recurred to his mind, he fixed his thoughts on Mary Gray. Mary Gray with the elusive eyes and mocking smile. If she had picked up the torn note as he believed, she had done so with deliberate purpose. What that purpose was, it was for him to find out. From Mary Gray his thoughts wandered to Lady Ursula's missing maid. He had gone to no little pains in questioning the servants in regard to her, but had learned little save that Rose, whom he remembered as an extremely pretty girl with light hair, was not a favorite with the other servants, especially the women, who pronounced her a designing minx, and declared that she gave herself the airs of a lady. The servants were divided in opinion as to whether she had taken the necklace, the consensus of opinion seeming to be that she had simply left the manor in order to join some mysterious lover who, according to her own accounts, had promised to make her a lady. But when Mr. Clavering pressed for particulars concerning this man, the servants, one and all, became singularly uncommunicative. Either they did not know who he was, or for some reason were unwilling to tell. Mr. Clavering judged the latter supposition to be the case. At all events, Rose's flight had evidently been premeditated, for a search through her room revealed the fact that she had taken with her a travelling bag and clothing. None of the servants could give any clue as to when she had gone or where she would be likely to go. While Mr. Clavering was puzzling over his vague suspicions, he heard a cautious fumbling at the garden door. He turned quickly in his chair. A tall, magnificently proportioned, fair-haired man was entering. "'Meldrum!' he cried, rising to his feet. The lights were burning low in the library, and the newcomer had not at first seen Mr. Clavering, who had been sitting with his back to the garden door, sunk in the depths of a big Morocco chair. But as the light from the candelabra under which he stood revealed his short, somewhat rotund figure, almost bald head, and round, freshly colored face, surprise, and more, dismay, showed itself on Meldrum's handsome countenance. He made an effort to recover himself. "'Why, hello, Clavering,' he said in his hearty voice. "'What keeps you up so late?' Mr. Clavering's ugly suspicion grew. "'Why must Meldrum come creeping in like a—' "'Nonsense!' he indignantly rejected the thought. "'Oh, we all feel greatly concerned over the theft of Lady Pevensey's necklace,' he answered as easily as he could, but watched the effect of his words on Meldrum. "'I was sitting here having a quiet, uh, cogitation.' "'Has Lady Pevensey sent yet to Scotland Yard?' asked Meldrum with concern. "'Not yet,' replied Mr. Clavering guardedly. He did not like this question coming so abruptly from Meldrum. "'I thought you had missed the last train,' he remarked. "'I heard it over an hour ago.' "'The last train?' repeated Meldrum vaguely. 
a quick flush covered his whole face this blond giant typical of his race looked then for all the world like a guilty schoolboy oh i caught it he said hurriedly i walked from the station there was no carriage it's a er, longish walk uh, especially at night he finished lamely lord meldrum was not good at lying he was as conscious of the fact as mr clavering he paused one foot on the stairs coming up clavering when i am through my uh, cogitation meldrum smiled showing two rows of perfect white teeth his smile gave him an almost boyish appearance don't overtax your cogitating apparatus clavering old fellow he said affectionately good night mr sherlock holmes mr clavering sat staring after him he said that he had walked from the station but the road from the station was dry and dusty meldrum's boots were covered with boggy mud where could he have been end of chapter three chapter four of that affair at portstead manor by gladys edson locke this librivox recording is in the public domain mr clavering has a night of adventure mr clavering went up to bed but not to sleep it was the beginning of a series of sleepless nights for him and all at portstead manor he found himself weary and yet wakeful obsessed by unwelcome suspicions and tossing restlessly from side to side in vain search for the sleep that would not come far away a chiming clock struck one but otherwise a deathly hush held the old house suddenly came a sound to his ear muffled though resonant and unmistakable a woman's sob the heavy strangling gasp of one in the throes of anguish or despair mr clavering sat up in bed and listened intently the noise could not have been far away and was probably in the west wing near his room it could not have come from lady pevensey for she slept in the east wing the only women whose rooms were near his were lady ursula and elsie baring he did not think it could be elsie baring whose sob he had heard if it were lady ursula was meldrum the cause how that suspicion would obtrude itself he waited nerves tense but the sob was not repeated and he was about to lay down again when there fell on his ear another sound faint but distinct a peculiar sound a tap tap tapping it was a rhythmic noise and growing louder what was it where did it come from apparently from the floor above and it was not unlike a ghostly rapping certainly it sounded ghostly at that hour of the night but mr clavering was a materialist and he was about to get up and investigate when there came a clattering and a thud followed by a piercing scream which caused him to leap from the bed before he could don his dressing gown he heard a door near his open and close and someone running down the hall struggling with his dressing gown which seemed to have no armholes he hurried down the dark corridor in the direction whence the noise had come he heard other doors opening and excited voices crying out to know what the matter was at the foot of a flight of stairs leading up to the unused north wing he saw a woman standing looking upward the moonlight flooding through an uncurtained window shone upon the gold-red hair and white shocked face of lady ursula she was still in her ball gown oh mr clavering she cried breathlessly as he advanced toward her with solicitude have i roused the entire household it was so dark i lost my footing and fell the whole flight i think i i have sprained my ankle she sank down weakly on the bottom stair and buried her face in her hands shuddering mr clavering looked at her perplexedly what could she have been doing after midnight in the north wing a portion of the manor which she had told her guests was unfinished and had once been used for storage but had now not been opened for years he had little time for speculation guests and servants in all stages of disarray were flocking to the stairs lady pevensey in a marvellous headgear of the genus boudoir cap and with her face swathed in a big motor veil brought up the rear excitedly demanding if the thief had been captured lord meldrum his face full of concern pushed through the circle about lady ursula did you fall down the stairs are you hurt just a little my ankle she said faintly mr clavering noticed with surprise that meldrum was fully dressed as he had seen him last even to the mud-soaked boots that had roused his suspicions portstead too had evidently not been to bed though he had exchanged his evening suit for a lounging robe he looked haggard and careworn 
and evinced more displeasure than solicitude over his sister's fall. Mr. Clavering wondered why he did not inquire what she was doing in the north wing at that hour, but it apparently did not interest him. It was Elsie Baring who put this not unnatural question. Lady Ursula made some confused explanation that no one could understand, and hastily accepted Meldrum's proffered arm to assist her to her room. As she limped past Mr. Clavering, leaning on Meldrum, perhaps more than was needful, he saw that her eyes were red and swollen. It was she, then, whose sob he had heard. But this being the case, how could it have been she who fell down the stairs? He had heard no door open till the fall and scream, and he was sure that the person who ran down the hall in response to it was a woman. The steps were light, and there had been a swish of skirts. Presumably this was Lady Ursula, but if so, who had fallen down the stairs? At that moment Mr. Clavering received a shock. Lady Pevensey's veil came unwound, and he was then and there initiated into certain secrets of that lady's night toilet. Being a gentleman of extreme delicacy of feeling, he immediately looked away and hurried to his room. As he approached Lady Ursula's, he saw Mary Grey in the doorway. She was offering to bathe and bind Lady Ursula's ankle in the absence of Rose. She would not hear to a refusal, and having enlisted Lord Meldrum on her side, proceeded to remove Lady Ursula's satin slipper, plainly against her wishes. Mr. Clavering went on to his own room to ponder over Lady Ursula's parting words to Meldrum, said in earnest, pleading tones, "'Please go to bed now, Wilfred. What is can't be helped.' When Mr. Clavering lighted his lamp, he could never think clearly in the darkness, he received a second shock. He found that in his excitement he had forgotten to put on his slippers and had gone about the house in his bare feet. That accounted, then, for Mary Gray's amused glances and for Beatrice Nolley's ill-suppressed giggles. He wondered if he would ever have the courage to face the ladies in the morning, especially Mary Gray. To a man of Mr. Clavering's nature, immaculately and fussily correct, no loss was so great as the loss of dignity. For the second time in his life he blushed at himself. So far his detective work had brought him only embarrassment. But would he get at the heart of the mystery yet and win Lady Pevensey's approval, if not more? It was some comfort to remember that she, too, had appeared at disadvantage, though the recollection of what the veil covered, or should have kept covered, still jarred on his aesthetic temperament. However, perhaps she did not every night put on those hideous plasters. Just then he heard Lady Ursula's door open. Mary Grey must have finished her ministrations. He listened for her to pass his room, as she must do to return to the east wing where she slept. Instead, the steps went down the hall in the opposite direction, toward the stairs to the north wing. Strange what should take her back there. It came into his mind that it might have been she who fell down the stairs. He decided to investigate. He went through the halls on tiptoe and without a lamp, wishing to come upon her unawares. As he drew near the stairs, he saw tiny lights flashing up and down them, and the sound as of someone creeping upward. He stole forward with added caution, scarcely drawing his breath. He was certainly on the track of an important clue. "'Won't you hold the flashlight for me, Mr. Clavering?' suddenly spoke up Mary Gray in the most matter-of-fact tone. Mr. Clavering gasped. So she was actually going to brazen it out, the minx! "'It's not dangerous, Mr. Clavering,' she said softly. Again he had the disagreeable sensation that she was making sport of him. It was not to be endured. "'Miss Gray,' he returned very stiffly, "'I think that your presence here at this hour requires explanation. If you are unwilling to explain to me, I must insist on your doing so to Lady Ursula.' "'Don't you think, Mr. Clavering,' she asked without a trace of anger, "'that Lady Ursula owes her guests an explanation, a true explanation of the fall and scream that roused us from our sleep?' "'Lady Ursula gave an explanation.' "'Yes, but did you believe it?' "'Miss Gray,' said Mr. Clavering severely, "'I did not follow you here to answer questions, but to put them.' Mary Gray bent toward him over the balustrade. "'Mr. Clavering, you aspire to be a second Sherlock Holmes, but you are on the wrong clue, decidedly. It is not I who stole the necklace, or even fell down the stairs.' Mr. Clavering resented this reading of his thoughts. Moreover, it seemed to him suspicious. "'I have not accused you of being the thief, Miss Gray, but I repeat that your presence here requires explanation. "'Hold the flashlight and you shall have the explanation,' she answered quickly. 
Mr. Clavering, his astonishment deepening, took the light. "'Flash it! Flash it!' she said impatiently. "'There! Do you see on this stair and the one above, on every one except the upper, a long scar, a fresh scar?' He followed her pointing finger. "'I see it,' he responded eagerly. "'What do you make of it?' His eyes sought hers, no longer mocking, but earnest, brilliant. "'The clattering noise!' he exclaimed. "'Ah, there was a clattering noise?' she demanded breathlessly. "'My room was so far away I could not be sure. That explains the scar. Mr. Clavering, the person who fell down the stairs, carried a stout stick or cane, and it was not Lady Ursula. She lied about her ankle. It was not sprained or bruised in the slightest.' Mr. Clavering was hardly surprised, but he was bewildered. He could not yet feel much faith in Mary Grey. At best, she was a person of mystery. Again she seemed to read his thoughts. "'I have as much interest as you in discovering the thief,' she said earnestly. "'As Lady Pevensey's hired companion, I am naturally placed in a very unpleasant position by the theft of the necklace.' It was all very plausible, but Mr. Clavering's doubts remained. "'You do not trust me,' she said with a queer little sigh. He did not deny the imputation, but resorted again to questioning. "'Do you think that the person who fell down the stairs is in the north wing now?' Mary Grey put her head on one side and appeared to be listening. "'I think,' she answered in crisp, quick tones, "'that somebody is trying to enter the library who may not be wanted there.' Mr. Clavering listened tensely. He heard it, too, the sound of a key stealthily turning in a lock, the circular stairs leading down to the library were but a few feet away. He hastened toward them. "'Remember that you are unarmed,' whispered Mary Grey. He had indeed forgotten. While he hesitated, steps, heavy and rather unsteady, were heard crossing the library. "'He's coming up,' whispered Mary Grey, pulling Mr. Clavering back against the wall. He surely was coming up, slowly and stumblingly. Mr. Clavering, casting about him for some means of defence, ruthlessly snatched down a curtain of rare old tapestry hanging above him. Peering down from the dark hall, he could see the man now, a shadowy, slender figure with top hat at rakish tilt. As he mounted the last spiral of the stairway, Mr. Clavering swooped upon him, flinging the tapestry about his head. The intruder gasped and struggled to free himself from the enveloping folds, but only succeeded in winding them tighter. Mr. Clavering threw both arms about his prisoner, and bore him to the floor. "'Now, then, who are you, sir?' he demanded sternly. "'Hang it all! Do you want to suffocate a fellow?' growled a muffled voice from the tapestry. "'I'm Mr. Robert Sylvester. Who the devil are you?' End of chapter 4「Mr. Robert Sylvester」Mr. Clavering went back to bed after his capture of Robert Sylvester and remained there until called by his valet. By breakfast time Robert had slept off his unsteadiness of gait and before the meal was over sauntered nonchalantly into the room. The manner of his arrival was known to all, but apparently Mr. Clavering felt more embarrassed over it than did he. Robert's chief concern seemed to be to ingratiate himself with his brother, who plainly resented this addition to the house-party. Lady Ursula was manifestly very fond of her scapegrace younger brother, though somewhat disconcerted by his coming. He appeared fond of her, too, in a careless, boyish fashion, and there came an angry flash in his eye when Portstead directed some sarcastic remark to her. A similar flash leaped into Meldrum's eyes, and he brought his clenched hand down upon the table. There was a marked resemblance between Lady Ursula and Robert. Both had fair hair shading to red, dark eyes, and clear-cut, delicate features. But in the case of Robert, the mouth was loose, the chin weak, and the complexion becoming pasty. Yet, in spite of these defects, there was much that was attractive in his face. If it lacked the ascetic strength of Portstead's, it lacked also its repellent hardness. Elsie Baring was visibly confused by Robert's presence, and piqued by the nonchalance of his greeting. But to judge from the way his glance constantly travelled back to her, his nonchalance was assumed. He expressed a proper sympathy over Lady Pevensey's loss, and Mr. Clavering wondered why Portstead's keen, cold eye rested so sharply on him. Altogether it was an uncomfortable meal. 
Mr. Clavering noticed that Lady Ursula still kept up the fiction of a sprained ankle, and being unwilling to suspect her of worse motives, persuaded himself that it might be mainly for the sake of bringing out the protective tenderness of Meldrum's nature. He insisted upon fairly carrying her to the terrace, and ensconcing her in the most comfortable chair, banked with innumerable cushions. He gave up a game of bowls with Colonel Darrell and Sir Gerald Leslie, always his favorite sport, to sit by her and amuse her. It was good to see how his blue eyes, rather severe and determined, softened when they met hers, and how the bronzed pink of his complexion deepened. There, thought Mr. Clavering, are two people who might be happy if— If what? He glanced towards the tall, spare frame of Portstead, who was regarding them disapprovingly. Why should he be the arbiter of his sister's destiny? Why should he assume toward her the authority of a master, rather than the affection of a brother? Portstead was an excellent fellow, of course, but he was immensely unpleasant to live with. Small wonder he had never found a woman willing to link her life to his. But, pondered Mr. Clavering, did he know any reason outside of politics why Meldrum should not marry his sister? Anything against Meldrum? It was unanswerable. Mr. Clavering still felt a little fearful of meeting the railries of the ladies and wandered away by himself, spending the morning in fruitless search for clues. At luncheon, Robert Sylvester asked his brother for a few minutes' private conversation, but Portstead answered curtly that he and his secretary were occupied with state papers, and that he would not be at liberty to attend to personal matters until late in the evening. Robert cast a furtive, hopeless glance at his sister, who shook her head as hopelessly. "'I should be glad, Lord Meldrum,' remarked Portstead, in cold, distinct tones at the conclusion of the meal, "'if you could come to the library to-night at ten. I do not expect that I shall be free until then. There are certain matters which you and I must come to agreement upon.' "'Cecil!' cried his sister imploringly. "'I have decided,' he responded, with an air of finality. There was dumb misery in Lady Ursula's eyes, but she said nothing more. That afternoon the library was closed to the guests, and Mr. Clavering, in his wanderings about the garden, saw through the leaded glass door of the library Lord Portstead and his secretary hard at work upon a pile of official-looking documents. "'Has it ever occurred to you, Mr. Clavering?' queried a soft voice at his ear that Lord Portstead is somewhat of a tyrant to his sister? Mr. Clavering turned to survey Mary Grey displeasedly. "'I do not think it proper to discuss my host and hostess,' he replied with emphasis. "'No, of course not,' she murmured contritely. "'You know best what is proper.' But again there was that inscrutable light in her eyes that made him so uncomfortable. What a way she had of stealing about, and what a strange taste always to dress in Grey! There was something uncanny about her. "'Mr. Clavering,' resumed the soft voice with its hint of mockery lady pevensey is getting impatient for you to discover the thief or at least some clue to his identity she will give you three more days in which to investigate and then she really thinks that she will send for that woman detective mercedes quero of whom miss baring spoke mr clavering was at once on his mettle three days should be ample time for my investigations but i must beg lady pevensey to remember that the necklace was not missing until last night I hardly think that even this famed Mercedes Quero could have recovered it in so short a time. "'Oh, I am sure she could not,' returned Mary Grey, with perhaps a little too much warmth to be wholly sincere. "'In fact, I told Lady Pevensey so, and advised her to give you three days more.' Mr. Clavering reddened. This girl was actually patronizing him. "'Oh, but this was too much. She must be shown her place.' "'That was kind of you, Miss Grey,' he remarked pompously but I scarcely think that your, ah, uh, intervention was necessary. Lady Pevensey would possibly have come to the same decision herself. Oh, I fear not, she gently demurred. Mr. Clavering bestowed upon her an exceedingly haughty, aristocratic stare, and was rewarded by a piquant, and yes, irresistible smile. He was furious with himself for yielding to it. Mr. Clavering, let us be friends, she exclaimed impulsively. Let us work together. We both have strong motives for wishing to discover the thief. Why should we not join forces? But Mr. Clavering had withdrawn into his shell. He was not going to allow this young woman to beguile him with her soft, sly ways. You will pardon me, Miss Gray, he replied with dignity, but in a matter of this kind I prefer to work alone. She was not at all crestfallen, but flashed another smile at him, absolutely without pique. 
you are quite right mr clavering she agreed sweetly by working alone we shall be better able to form independent conclusions of course you have accounted by now for the disappearance of the person who fell downstairs probably you have investigated the north wing well no he hadn't before he could explain that he felt a natural delicacy in poking about a section of the house obviously closed to guests mary gray had slipped away into the park mr clavering pondered long over his conversation with this strange young woman was she honest or was she not was it his duty as she had suggested to investigate the north wing he hardly thought so it need not be that the person who fell down the stairs was the thief a light suddenly broke in upon him mary gray wished him to believe so but why should she wish it why indeed save to divert suspicion from herself he made up his mind then and there that he would abandon his absurd distrust of meldrum and devote himself to studying mary gray with this resolution he went to dress for dinner this meal was even more markedly unpleasant than the preceding the dining hall seen by the subdued light of shaded lamps was a place of shadow and gloom a long lofty apartment heavily raftered by huge beams of black oak that hung like a pall above one's head here one's voice would involuntarily become hushed and one's spirit oppressed even without the constraining presence of portstead the earl had allowed himself a recess from his labors he had rigid ideas of what was owing to his guests but the younger people at least felt that his presence was a courtesy with which they would have been willing to dispense robert's ingratiating manner was gone and he appeared sulkily defiant deliberately introducing topics that he knew were offensive to his brother in vain lady ursula sought to turn the conversation from racing and ballet dancers robert drifted to sir julian travers the sporting baronet whose name had long been taboo in polite circles travers who had dissipated his own and his mother's fortune and had finally fled england to escape the consequences of a spectacular forgery was portstead's pet aversion robert's unfortunate introduction of travers name gave the earl opportunity to dilate upon the heinousness of his crimes and thence to draw a parallel between his life and robert's aimless spendthrift one robert retaliated by a contemptuous remark cuttingly personal that whipped the color into portstead's bloodless cheeks he controlled himself however and steadily observed that there was a train leaving for london at half after eight and that there would be a carriage at his brother's disposal at a quarter to eight robert responded by an oath that caused lady pevensey to clasp her jewelled hands over her ears in horror and elsie baring to flush painfully you think you're a demigod or the lord almighty himself because you have come into the money and title shouted robert shaking his fist in his brother's face in an access of unbridled fury but to have isn't to hold just you remember that you cold-blooded domineering saint with this he rushed from the room that was the last seen of him for many anxious hours there was a half-hearted attempt at playing bridge in the evening but when at ten o'clock meldrum excused himself to keep his appointment with portstead all were glad to avail themselves of the opportunity to escape to their rooms mr clavering observed that lady ursula's eyes followed meldrum anxiously almost fearfully and he suspected that the interview in the library would be a stormy one mr clavering was far from satisfied with his detective efforts so far he had really expected better of himself but one thing at least he had discovered lady pevensey had reluctantly admitted that mary gray had come to her practically unrecommended apparently she was a person of mysterious antecedents why lady pevensey should have taken such a person into her service was not clear to him but he presumed that she had been attracted by her ladylike appearance she was undeniably a gentlewoman he had also learned from the same source that mary gray contemplated a trip to london in the morning on some private business he had decided to go up to the city on the same train if she had taken the necklace this would be her chance to dispose of it he sat up until midnight listening for a repetition of the weird tapping of the night before but heard nothing in any way unusual so decided to go to bed however he thought it well in case of unforeseen happenings to keep a night lamp burning and his dressing gown and slippers within easy reach he could not explain why but there seemed something menacing in the very stillness of the old house finally he dozed off to dream of all manner of impossible clues at two o'clock in the morning he was roused by a pistol shot it came apparently from the floor below for a moment he found himself unable to move 
Then, shaking off the paralysis of terror that held him, he got into his dressing gown and slippers and resolutely stepped into the corridor, bearing the night lamp and armed with his silver-knobbed walking stick. Doors were opening from all parts of the house, and he was greeted by low screams and excited questions. Colonel Darrell pushed by him and sprang down the broad, curving staircase into the great main hall. Mr. Clavering was not sorry to see a pistol gleaming in his hand. The women, guests, and servants, their faces white patches in the darkness, were leaning over the square, balustrated gallery that ran around the top of the great hall and were peering down into the black gulf below. Mary Gray, however, hastened after Colonel Darrell, showing an astonishing eagerness and lack of fear. Mr. Clavering was ashamed not to follow her, but the night lamp shook in his hand as he went. He was amazed to behold Lady Ursula coming swiftly from the drawing-room, for he could not understand how she had descended the stairs before the others. He had not seen her at all until now, as she stood there before them, hastily wrapped in an evening cloak, and her face blue-white in the moonlight that streamed through the thin, high windows of the hall. "'The shot was in here!' she cried. "'I think it was in the—the the library!' Mary Gray was the first to reach the library door. It was locked. There was no light under it. She knocked several times, but received no response. "'Cecil!' screamed Lady Ursula, beating against the door. "'Cecil!' "'Lady Ursula!' interposed Colonel Darrell gravely. "'We must enter this room. Have I your permission to break down the door?' She nodded mutely. She was on the verge of collapse. "'It will not be necessary to break down the door, Colonel Darrell,' spoke up Mary Gray quickly. "'Simply grasp the knob firmly in both hands and press your knee just below the lock with all your strength. It will yield.' Colonel Darrell gave her a peculiar look but obeyed. Mr. Clavering had a feeling of repulsion toward her as the lock gave with the least possible amount of noise, and the door flew open. He had read of how burglars employed this same trick for forcing locks. How came she to know of it? The huge library lay before them, black-shadowed, awesome. There came a rush of air through the open garden door, and the moonlight flooding in made visible a dim form outstretched upon the floor. While even Colonel Darrell, rough old campaigner that he was, stopped horrified upon the threshold, Mary Gray sprang by him into the room and, dropping to her knees, bent over the still form. "'He is dead,' she said after a moment, in a hushed voice. "'Mr. Clavering, bring your lamp here.' Colonel Darrell strove to prevent Lady Ursula from entering, but she pressed past him, and, snatching the lamp from Mr. Clavering, held it over the upturned face of the dead man. "'Cecil! Oh, Cecil!' she moaned, and swaying was caught in Colonel Darrell's arms. End of chapter 5"'A powerful figure loomed up in the garden doorway. A moment later, Lord Meldrum bounded into the room. He stopped short, staring at the still form on the floor. "'My God! Is he dead?' burst from his lips. Mary Gray suddenly rose and deliberately flashed the lamp full in Meldrum's face. He was flushed and breathing hard, and his eyes held utter horror and something of consternation, too. Harry Brooks, Portstead's secretary, sprang toward him. "'Lord Meldrum!' he cried. There has been more than murder done. The papers with which I have been assisting his lordship have been stolen. Meldrum slowly turned his eyes from the dead earl to the small, dark, commonplace young man who had been his secretary. Well, he said, interrogatively and half-dazedly, you know the importance of those papers, Lord Meldrum, asserted Harry Brooks, with meaning unmistakable. You know what gain it would be to the party whose interests are yours if they should get possession of them before they are ready for presentation to the house. Meldrum flushed tremendously, and his brows drew together. "'Brooks,' he said sharply, "'you forget yourself.' He went over to Lady Ursula, who was recovering from her faintness. The severity of his expression vanished, and was succeeded by a pitying tenderness, as he begged her to return to her room. "'I cannot go, and leave Cecil there,' she shuddered. "'Why does not somebody carry him upstairs?' "'He cannot be moved until the coroner comes,' interposed Mary Gray. "'The coroner!' gasped Lady Ursula. "'Why, it is suicide, nothing more. You must see that. It cannot be worse,' she emphasized piteously. 
i am afraid we cannot see that lady ursula returned mary grey seriously the pistol with which lord portstead was killed is not here but in any case it will be necessary to summon the coroner mr clavering regarded her with indignation what she said was perfectly true but she need not be so cold-blooded about it lord meldrum attempted to draw lady ursula from the room but she shrank from him with a little moan don't touch me meldrum went slowly white i beg your pardon he muttered i want to be alone she cried catching the amazement on the others faces i am going up to my room i don't want any one to come to me till she shuddered again till it is necessary meldrum his features working watched her as she tottered from the room then he wheeled upon harry brooke so fiercely that that little secretary recoiled if i hear any more of your beastly implications you will answer for them do you understand with that he strode from the library as though fearing to trust himself longer mr clavering had never before seen the jovial meldrum in a rage and he was startled by the slumbering fires that harry brooks had aroused he wished that he had not seen this hidden side of meldrum's nature a doctor had already been sent for and now colonel darrell advised that the coroner be immediately notified and that in the interim a search be made through the gardens mr clavering gave it as his advice that mary grey who showed a strange and it seemed to him unwomanly curiosity in the whole tragic happening should return to lady pevensey whose hysterical screams were unpleasantly audible but when the gentleman came back from a vain search through the grounds mary grey was just re-entering the library from the small book-room leading off it and separated from it only by a heavy curtain of old tapestry colonel darrell had already searched this room before going into the gardens but had discovered nothing there save old books stacked about the walls with that precision in which portstead had delighted as the room possessed but the one doorway opening from the library it could offer no clue to the disappearance of the assassin and mr clavering wondered what mary grey had been doing there she met his reproving eye with provoking unconcern and even followed him into the hall where candles had now been lighted mr clavering she murmured coaxingly after assuring herself that they were alone in the hall if you will promise not to look quite so cross i will show you something that i found something that should interest you mr clavering's eagerness overcame his amazement at her impertinence and he forbore to rebuke her what do you make of this she asked opening her handkerchief and disclosing some small dark particles mr clavering took down a candle from the silver sconce above him and studied them carefully why it is mud he decided at length mud that is just beginning to cake mary grey nodded i found this on the library floor mr clavering stared accusingly at the small cakes of mud the person who shot lord portstead must have had muddy boots he declared hoarsely mary grey nodded again and yet it has not rained for nearly two weeks there's a neat little problem for you mr clavering but he was deaf to the mocking challenge in her voice his old suspicions were taking shape how did meldrum fully dressed even to his hat happened to be outside the garden door at the time the shot occurred he remembered with a shock that meldrum's boots on the night before had been covered with much the same dark slimy mud as that which mary grey had gathered from the library floor were they so covered now the possibility that they were made him sick at heart and leaving mary grey abruptly he went upstairs for a solitary reflection lady pevensey in the same barbarous headgear and big motor veil that he recalled so vividly accosted him excitedly in the upper hall her eyes were wide with terror mr clavering she exclaimed with shrill impressiveness it was no human being that killed lord portstead mr clavering regarded her with anxious concern there there dear lady pevensey he said soothingly if you will only go back to bed and try to sleep you will feel more composed in the morning archibald clavering she snapped do you mean to insinuate that i am not in my right mind i tell you this house is haunted i am convinced of it mr clavering had heard that it was well to humour the mentally sick so he asked what makes you think so lady pevensey bent toward him sounds she whispered sounds in the wall his concern grew he wondered if temporary aberration were likely to prove serious i think i will call miss grey he said backing toward the stairs but lady pevensey clutched his arm i don't want mary grey she objected with venom she is worse than useless i intend to discharge her in the morning my nerves are in a frightful state if it didn't look like deserting ursula in her trouble i would leave the house this minute even if i had to walk to london mr clavering i did hear sounds in the wall 
footsteps just a few minutes before that awful pistol shot it was somebody walking in the hall suggested mr clavering more excited than he cared to own it was not in the hall it was in the wall reiterated lady pevensey testily and there were other sounds too there were rappings rappings repeated mr clavering startled he thought of the peculiar tapping he had heard the night before it did not come from the floor above he asked tentatively it came from the wall of my room she answered with conviction he saw that it was useless to attempt to reason her out of her delusion or persuade her to return to her room so he took her to elsie baring's the glimpse he had of elsie baring's wan face gave him rather of a shock the grim tragedy down in the library had been very hard on the women before going to his own room he glanced sympathetically toward lady ursula's closed door and was struck by its proximity to the circular stairs leading to the library it had not occurred to him before that it was almost directly opposite these stairs standing by it now he could hear the grave low-pitched voice of colonel darrell and the tense voice of harry brooks both of whom were keeping vigil with the dead the shot must have sounded startlingly loud to lady ursula he remembered that the single door in the library at the foot of the circular stairs had been open when colonel darrell forced the other door if her door too had been open she might have heard more than the shot the thought was not a pleasant one mr clavering had never before felt such desire to escape from himself and his thoughts his uneasiness drew him on down the corridor to the stairs leading up to the north wing he wished he had brought a light he would have liked to examine again the scar made on them the night before he was about to go back for his lamp when he heard a sound that held him rooted to the spot somewhere in the black region stretching above a door slammed there was not a breath of wind to blow it somebody must be in the north wing he did not stop to consider that he was unarmed his detective zeal was too strong on tiptoe and rapidly he mounted the stairs to what might have been an egyptian darkness for all he could see on the top stair he halted he had the distinct impression that there was somebody near him he fancied that he could hear quick breathing realizing that by standing there outlined against the lighter hall below he was but making a target of himself if any one cared to attack he took a groping step forward the next instant something crashed violently into his face reeling backward under the blow he thudded over the stairs head foremost End of chapter six chapter seven of that affair at portstead manor by gladys edson locke this librivox recording is in the public domain surmises and suspicions he landed with a jarring shock and lost count of time and space from that moment until he became vaguely aware of a pair of strong and rough hands that shook him by the shoulder next instant he felt himself drifting rising dragged along through space and finally let fall with a cruel jar by those same strong rough hands upon some hard unyielding substance which he took to be the floor again he lost himself in void and then half conscious grew dimly irritated at a sudden glare of light beating into his face again a hand shook him by the shoulder but this time gently though none the less determinately and the light burned into his eyes persistently he heard his name called from a distance and pushing open his heavy lids stared up into the pale concerned face of mary gray who was bending over him candle held aloft she met his wondering gaze with a little flashing smile of relief i was really getting worried mr clavering he sat up with caution and the effort cost him a groan he feared his head would burst and the dark wainscoting was all starred with flecks of light slowly his vision cleared and it all came back to him the slamming of the door in the north wing the crashing blow the fall he looked about him painfully for the stairs down which he had thudded in an access of bewilderment he caught at mary gray's slim hand there were no stairs above him only the corridor stretching straight beyond in the gray dimness of the coming dawn before him in the candlelight he made out the curve of the circular stairs the circular stairs which led down to the library how did he come there was the question that whirled through his throbbing head then he remembered those strong rough hands that had gripped and raised him he turned accusingly to mary gray she was regarding him with a curious intensity did you carry me here he demanded 
she rose to her feet and drawing her slender figure to its full height glanced down scathingly at mr clavering's undeniable rotundity do i look as though i could carry you anywhere he was obliged to admit that she did not but someone carried me here from the north wing stairs he maintained a light broke over mary gray's face it seemed to him that mirth shone in her eyes what sort of gyrations were you performing on the north wing stairs she queried mr clavering pulled himself with difficulty to his feet and steadied himself against the wall his head whirring like a top and the wainscoting again star-flecked miss gray he made answer at length with a kind of desperate dignity i have been taught the painful lesson that the reward of the detective is rarely proportionate to the dangers he incurs she gave a little low amused laugh so you have been prying in the north wing she cried investigating miss gray he corrected well i wouldn't do it again if i were you she smiled in view of the injuries he had sustained mr clavering thought it hardly likely that he would he put his hand to his forehead there was an ugly protuberance jutting over his brows he was sure that his nose was broken, and there was another even larger swelling on the back of his head. "'Am I very badly disfigured?' he inquired anxiously. Mary Gray, to do her justice, this time controlled her twitching lips. "'Brown paper soaked in vinegar, I think, might improve your appearance,' she parried demurely. Mr. Clavering stiffly rejected the idea of brown paper and vinegar, and was about to remark that arnica would probably be sufficient when there sounded a ponderous knocking through the manor. It was the doctor and the coroner arriving together. With them was a detective from Scotland Yard. While these officials were making their examinations, Mr. Clavering repaired to his room, and with the solicitous aid of Jenkins, his valet, attempted to remove the marks of his investigation. But the more effort expended, the uglier and bigger grew the swellings. With a sigh, he bade Jenkins desist. He glanced in the mirror and groaned aloud. "'Jenkins,' he asked sadly, "'am I recognizable?' Jenkins coughed discreetly. "'I, I shouldn't like to venture an opinion, sir.' Just then a servant came with the announcement that the coroner was conducting a preliminary inquiry in the library and desired Mr. Clavering's presence. Mr. Clavering felt that it was a very unpleasant place to conduct the inquiry, and on the way there, passing Lord Portstead's chamber, to which his body had been removed, he was so obsessed by the horror of what had happened that he forgot his disfigurements. He was reminded of them by the gasp of astonishment that arose when he stepped into the library. Conscious that every eye was on the black and yellow protuberance that even he could see, he slunk into a chair behind Lord Meldrum. Mary Grey came in then to say that Lady Pevensey was in a state of hysteria that forbade her being present. Mr. Clavering saw the detective give a little start at the sight of Mary Gray. He noticed also that a faint pink stole into her cheeks, and that the glance she gave him conveyed some message, apparently of appeal. So, he thought, she is known to Scotland Yard. He was not surprised, but, well, yes, he did feel vaguely sorry. She was an attractive young woman, after all. Lady Ursula was the last to appear. She did not come as the others had through the main door from the lower hall, but she dragged slowly down the circular stairs, her nerves evidently at the snapping point. Though conventionality decreed that the high-bred woman stifle her emotions under a mask of impassable calm, Lady Ursula had long passed the stage where conventionality could be obeyed. The change that these few hours had wrought in her was pitiful. Her face was intensely pale but it was the utter hopeless misery and brooding horror in her eyes that struck Mr. Clavering so forcibly. Lord Meldrum sprang forward and placed a chair for her. She took it in silence, giving him a peculiar look, questioning and fearful. It affected him deeply, and he turned away to hide his emotion. The coroner, out of consideration for Lady Ursula's state of collapse, put as few questions as possible to her. In fact, she had little to tell. Worrying over the theft of Lady Pevensey's necklace, she had sat up late, had heard the report of a pistol, and fearing she knew not what, had gone downstairs to investigate. "'Did your ladyship go down by these circular stairs?' suddenly interrupted Burton, the detective. Inspector Burton was a youngish man with keen, aggressive eyes and a bulldog set to his jaw. Mr. Clavering, surprised at the question, 
saw Mary Grey lean forward in her chair and scan Lady Ursula's face. As for Lady Ursula, she gave Burton a quick, startled look and answered hastily, "'Why, why, no, I went down the main stairway. Why should you ask?' "'Oh,' replied Burton easily, unabashed by the coroner's frown at his officiousness, "'a servant told me that your room was very near the circular stairs, and I noticed that you just now came down them.' Lady Ursula went a shade paler. "'When I heard the shot, I came down the main stairs,' she reiterated tonelessly. Mr. Clavering gripped the arm of his chair. Was she telling the truth? To go down the main stairway, she must have passed his door, and he was certain that no one had passed it between the time of the shot and his opening of the door. If she had passed it afterwards, how came she downstairs before anyone else, when he had no recollection of seeing her in the halls? She had come out from the drawing-room. Could she have been downstairs before the shot? He felt a cold chill running over him. He tried resolutely to banish the ugly thought, but it refused to be banished. Through a cloud of distorted fancies, he heard the coroner put some questions concerning the discovery of the body. Mary Grey was able to give the best account, cool and concise. He felt that there was something unnatural about her composure, something unwomanly. Not having wide acquaintance with the modern, nerveless young woman, he believed that more or less hysteria was only woman's prerogative upon a harrowing occasion like this. For a woman to be even more composed than the men argued that she must be abnormal and unsexed. The coroner took a few notes upon Mary Gray's testimony, but he seemed anxious to make the next train back to the city. He gave some instructions to Burton, set the public inquest for Tuesday week, and after gravely shaking hands with Lady Ursula, took his departure, accompanied by the doctor. "'May I ask your ladyship just one or two more questions?' interposed Burton as she was about to leave the room. Lady Ursula paused, one slippered foot on the circular stairs, almost a hunted look in her eyes. Meldrum went over quickly and stood by her side. Mr. Clavering fancied that she shrank a little. "'Can't you see?' demanded Meldrum indignantly. "'That her ladyship needs rest and quiet. You must not torture her with questions now.' But Lady Ursula drew herself up with something of her usual stateliness. She would not give way to weakness before this obtrusive police official." "'I am quite well,' she said calmly. "'What do you wish to ask me, Mr. Burton, I believe?' The detective stepped nearer. "'Your ladyship has a younger brother,' he said with deliberation. "'Has he been notified yet of the tragic happening that has brought him into the title and estates of the late Earl of Portstead?' In spite of herself, Lady Ursula shivered. "'Not yet.' "'I have been told,' pursued Burton, "'that Mr. Robert Sylvester has been here for a day or so. May I ask where he is now?' Lady Ursula was watching the detective curiously. "'I don't know,' she admitted faintly. Elsie Baring suddenly pressed forward. "'Why should it matter to you, Mr. Burton, where Robert Sylvester is now?' Burton turned his keen, hard eyes upon her. She faced him, trembling, but with a certain defiance in her attitude, and repeated her question. "'Why,' answered Burton, with a drawling enunciation, peculiarly at variance with his general aspect of alert aggressiveness, I simply thought it was Mr. Robert Sylvester's place to be here and help his sister bear up. That is not what you thought, she contradicted hotly. But I tell you, you are wrong, wrong. Bursting into tears, she fled from the room. Lady Ursula stared after her sadly, Meldrum in complete dismay. Mr. Clavering began to wish that Meldrum would learn to mask his emotions. One after another, they chased across his mobile face, making it an open book for all to read. But what contradictory reading! Burton appeared to find it interesting, for he abruptly shifted his gaze from Elsie Baring's vanishing figure to Meldrum. "'Lord Meldrum,' he began in his slow, deliberate way. "'Miss er, er, Gray,' his hesitancy over her name, struck Mr. Clavering at once. "'Miss Gray, in the clear account she gave of the finding of Lord Portstead's body, stated that you came into the library by the garden door, which was open.' and that Lord Portstead's secretary shortly afterwards informed you that important government papers were missing. "'I informed Lord Meldrum that they were stolen!' burst out Harry Brooks explosively. "'So you did, Brooks,' said Meldrum quietly, but the quick flush that covered his face belied his composure. "'And it is my advice that nothing be said yet about the loss of the papers.' "'Theft of the papers,' corrected Harry Brooks fiercely. Meldrum nodded forbearingly. In any case, it can do no good to take the world into our confidence. 
a secret search will be far more likely to bear fruit well i think you're right about that lord meldrum remarked burton and jotted down a few more notes but brooks was not satisfied he seemed to be possessed of vindictiveness toward meldrum if i were a detective he said significantly i should ask lord meldrum what he was doing outside the garden door at two o'clock in the morning lady ursula caught her breath sharply meldrum flushed again but he showed no anger rather a sort of tolerant contempt for the secretary you are overwrought brooks he said with a touch of class hauteur it might be just as well lord meldrum insinuated burton softly if you would tell us what you were doing out in the garden lord meldrum hesitated lady ursula's eyes sought his fearfully there was a painful silence at last meldrum said quickly and somewhat incoherently i had a late interview in the library with lord portstead i felt unable to sleep after it and i went out into the garden leaving the door open unexpectedly demanded mary gray meldrum turned toward her in surprise i do not remember burton was taking notes rapidly now brooks edged nearer lord meldrum there was no mistaking his hatred of the blond giant towering above him i should like to know if this interview was an unpleasant one he asked with a ring of triumph in his voice lady ursula clutched meldrum's arm from his splendid height he looked down upon the little secretary as though he would have crushed him that brooks is no affair of yours he said sternly burton closed his memorandum with a snap thank you very much lady ursula for putting up with me so long i don't think i've got any more questions to ask just now i guess i've got enough here he gave his little book an affectionate slap i guess i've got enough here to keep me ruminating for a while End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. More Mystery. The morning passed in gloomy quiet. Mr. Clavering's head was too painful to admit of his following clues or seeking new ones, and he was obliged to leave all the investigating to Burton, who was prowling about the house and grounds with an avidity that was positively ghoulish. From his lotioned windows, Mr. Clavering had occasional glimpses of a grey dress flitting among the trees. He was glad that Mary Grey had not carried out her plan of going up to the city. He would not have felt able to follow her, even if she had taken with her twenty stolen necklaces. In fact, the theft was beginning to pale in comparison with the greater crime. He wondered if there were a connection between them. He sat up with a sudden start that shot circles of pain through his head. There must be a connection. Lady Pevensey's chamber had been the starting point of all the mystery which had ended in tragedy she had even heard there a few moments before the shot footsteps in the wall so she maintained and the tapping sound that had so puzzled him evidently the gathered threads of the mystery were to be sought in her rooms rather than in the north wing perhaps mr clavering was a little over eager to accept the belief that no clue was to be found in the north wing however viewed in the matter-of-fact daylight the slamming of a door became less significant there might have come a sudden gust of wind and what had crashed into his face might have been a falling piece of furniture though why it should fall without human agency was not quite clear to him and at the time he had had the impression that it was a stout chair wielded by a pair of powerful arms that had sent him thudding over the stairs the same pair of arms presumably that had borne him to the top of the circular stairs but with such a throbbing head as his it brought him some small comfort to explain away inconsistencies and resolved to confine his investigations for a while at least to lady pevensey's rooms he knew that she had declined to enter them again and he now sent jenkins to lady ursula to inquire if he might not have these rooms on the plea that he had always been accustomed to a chamber lighted by the morning sun which was perfectly true jenkins brought back word that lady ursula was willing but suggested that there were other empty rooms in the east wing larger than lady pevensey's and equally sunny and that mr clavering had best make his choice of these but he directed jenkins to move his effects at once to lady pevensey's rooms and by noon he was installed there with head improving and detective zeal renewed a thorough search of the rooms failed to reveal anything extraordinary about them except that in spite of the greater sunlight they were more sombre than those he had quitted but it was a sombreness that mr clavering who was something of an antiquarian rejoiced in 
with appreciative eye he studied the arched ceiling panelled in black oak the broader dark oak panelling of the walls and the massive wrought fireplace were the bright colours restored to the age dim tapestries he could well have imagined himself back in the days of elizabeth when portstead manor was new the furniture stately and old furthered the illusion the only incongruous note being the modern dressing-table from which lady pevensey's necklace had been stolen from the mullioned casement he looked out beyond the gardens and the parkland to the woods that ringed the manor on the east and north and he was rudely brought back to the present those dense deep woods might they not afford a hiding-place for thief or murderer at least they were worth investigating but he was not destined to do so that day in the afternoon at lady ursula's request he went up to london to search for robert sylvester whom telegrams had failed to locate altogether mr clavering had never spent a more uncomfortable afternoon he was constantly dodging acquaintances for this modern beau brummel had no wish to be seen in so battered a plight as a matter of fact the trip to london had been nothing short of heroism on his part but he had been unable to resist the appeal in lady ursula's eyes burton's leading questions concerning robert and his continued non-appearance had alarmed her mr clavering spurred on by sympathy tried his best to locate the missing robert but all his efforts ended in failure at robert's lodgings he could learn nothing save that a very much worried young woman had called there in the morning and had gone away greatly disturbed at not finding mr sylvester more questioning elicited from the porter that she was very pretty and smartly dressed but not what he would call a lady mr clavering next tried the clubs frequented by london's gilded youth but learned nothing there save that robert was supposed to be out of town indefinitely he even sought out the domicile of a certain professional beauty whose praises robert had inadvisedly sung at dinner the night before miss st john however had heard nothing of him for a week but it was her belief that he had gone into hiding to escape persistent creditors so mr clavering was forced to bring back a most unsatisfactory report to lady ursula burton who seemed to be everywhere about the manor contrived to hear the greater part of the account and he proceeded to make entries in his book with an air of suppressed triumph mr clavering felt indignant it was clear enough whom burton suspected mr burton he said with an assumption of authority when lady ursula had withdrawn you are altogether wrong in trying to fasten this unspeakable crime on robert sylvester i know that he is wild and everything he should not be but he is a good-hearted boy and utterly incapable of taking his brother's life i should like to agree with you sir returned burton civilly but in the face of this it's a bit hard he held out a silver-mounted pistol mr clavering examined it gingerly on a small plate on the handle the name robert sylvester stared up at him where was this found he demanded hoarsely under the cushion of one of the library chairs if you will look through the chambers you will see that one of the bullets has been discharged but but robert sylvester was not in the manor at the time of the murder mr clavering set forth in protest that will have to be proved replied burton ominously at dinner mr clavering ate a desultory meal in company with mary gray to his relief it was served in the breakfast-room instead of the great gloomy dining-hall the other guests with the exception of lady pevensey elsie baring and lord meldrum had returned to their homes but lady pevensey and her niece were hardly less prostrated than their hostess while meldrum had gone to the country club in search of robert mary gray's usual vivacity had vanished and she seemed plunged in thought she scarcely spoke until they were rising from the table when she abruptly asked what do you think of burton as a detective i think he is on the wrong clue decidedly responded mr clavering with emphasis as a matter of fact i should classify his methods as commonplace and unfruitful he lacks imagination he he does lack imagination she assented quickly once he lights on what seems to him a clue he follows it up like a bloodhound mr clavering do you share his suspicions of robert sylvester no he answered but his voice wavered neither do i she said in spite of the pistol he told you of the pistol it was i who found it mr clavering stared amazedly but before he could question her she had left the room he was too weary to do anything that evening other than go to bed early he felt that now at least he could pass a night of peace the tragedy had happened but he should have learned by now that peace and portstead manor were alien to one another after two or three hours sleep from pure exhaustion 
he awoke with the sensation that something was wrong. His night lamp had burned out, and the room was intensely dark. He heard furtive footsteps, but whether in the room or in the corridor without, he could not be certain. Then followed a peal of thunder that shook the house, and the wind shrieked in the old gables, and the rain came driving in at the open casement. Thoroughly awakened now, he realized that the countryside was in the grasp of a terrific electric storm. The rain and the thunder were more severe than the lightning, and while groping about in the dark for matches, he came into painful collision with the dressing-table. But he forgot the pain in the discovery he made. The dressing-table drawer was wide open, as though hastily pulled out. It had been tightly closed when he went to bed. His senses were at once alert. There had been someone in his room. He was convinced that there was someone there now. His straining ears caught the sound of quick, smothered breathing. He stretched forth his hands and took a step forward. A slight rustling warned him that the person, whoever it was, was trying to escape. He moved rapidly in the direction of the intruder, and suddenly his groping hands touched other hands, those of a woman, a lady, slim and soft. With a little gasping cry, she shrank away. He caught at her dress, filmy and flowing, but she slipped from him, was gone. A vivid flare of lightning showed the room to be empty, also that the two doors leading from it were closed. He groped his way first to one and then to the other, and found that both were locked as well, just as he had left them upon retiring. In view of the two locked doors, there could be but one explanation of his visitor's disappearance. There must be a secret entrance to the room. Secret passages were by no means unusual in Elizabethan houses. It might well have been, through this passage, that the thief had entered and stolen Lady Pevensey's necklace. But why should any one come into the room now? And who could it have been? Mary Grey flashed into his mind. She wore just such filmy gowns as that which he had caught at. He had an unpleasant moment, while in imagination he pictured this mysterious young woman, who had no proper feminine shrinking at violent death, bending over his pillow while he slept. The darkness was intolerable, and the lightning too intermittent to admit of his finding the matches. He opened the hall door, hoping that there would be a light in the corridor. There was none, but from somewhere below, perhaps from the great hall, came a burst of elfish laughter. Shrill, witch-like, weird, it echoed through the wind-lashed manor. Mr. Clavering shuddered at the sound. Who could laugh out like that in this house of tragedy? Arming himself with a heavy brass and iron candlestick, and stopping only to don dressing-gown and slippers, which he had succeeded in discovering, he crept down the long corridor of the east wing toward the great main staircase, determined to make sure who it was that had come into his chamber, and then had dared to laugh out in elfish glee, for he did not doubt that they were one and the same person. He reached the foot of the stairs in safety, but he found the immense stone-flagged hall an eerie place in the dark and hush of midnight, a hush broken only now by the shrieking of the wind and the lashing drive of the rain. The thunder was dying away in the distance, but occasional flashes of lightning through the high-set windows gave transient glimpses of antlered heads upon the black walls and ghostly armored figures in dim recesses. Once it seemed to Mr. Clavering that something moved among the shadows by the stone-pillared fireplace. Courage was not his strongest virtue. The mystery of the great dark hall filled him with dread, and he was beginning slowly to retreat up the stairs when he heard quick, cautious steps crossing the large drawing-room. Now that there was need for action, some remnant of courage came to him, and with a determination to unmask this night-wanderer, he hastened manfully after the faintly echoing footfalls. Through the large drawing-room into the smaller, onto the ballroom, and through the long central gallery, he padded in his slippered feet, stumbling often against some stone urn or chest or chair, placed, it seemed, purposely in his way. But the footfalls he followed were always just ahead, and he could not overtake them. Suddenly, at the point where the central gallery branched off to the west wing, he came face against a half-closed door. It was the library door and it cost him effort to cross that threshold, but he knew that the elusive being he pursued was in that room. He heard a chair overturned, followed by a fierce, smothered ejaculation, then entire silence. He pushed wider the door, trying to feel secure in the effectiveness of his brass and iron candlestick. "'Who is in this room?' 
he demanded loudly, hoping to still the quaking of his heart by the volume of his tone. There was no reply save the sharp click of a lock. At that moment, the lightning's glare showed up with startling distinctness the figure of a tall, brawny-looking woman of gypsy type standing in the garden doorway. She was not one of the servants, nor had he ever seen her before. He bounded toward the door, but even before he had ascertained that it was tightly locked behind her, she had disappeared into the rain-swept gardens. A step on the circular stairs made him turn quickly. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Accusations Lady Ursula was trailing down in negligee, holding high a lighted candle which cast a pale halo about her beautiful, tense face, but served only to emphasize the gloom of the library. She came with slow and doubtful step, as though dreading what she might meet there. When she saw Mr. Clavering, wide-eyed at the foot of the stairs, an expression of immense relief, tinged with a vague annoyance, swept over her features. "'Oh!' she exclaimed. "'It's only you!' "'Only? Archibald Clavering?' He might have resented the implication, had he not remembered her state of mind, which could well excuse her from little distinctions of speech. "'I heard some commotion down here,' she explained rapidly. "'Is anything the matter?' Something surely was the matter with Mr. Clavering's sense of discretion. Elty would never have blurted out to an overwrought woman. "'The manor has been broken into!' The moment he had spoken he would have given much to recall this startling announcement, and he fully expected her to scream or faint. She did neither, however. Instead, she went to the garden door and tried the lock. "'You must be mistaken,' she said quietly. "'The door is locked.' "'The person—it was a woman—had a key and locked it after her.' "'Nonsense, Mr. Clavering,' she protested, with an attempt at a smile. "'Burglars don't lock doors after themselves. You must tell a better story than that, or I shall believe that you have had the nightmare.' "'That is a malady from which I am happily free,' he returned with dignity. "'This person, this woman, came first into my chamber, for what purpose I cannot imagine, and escaped through the secret door.' "'The secret door?' Her voice rang high. "'What do you mean, Mr. Clavering?' He felt that he should be more considerate of her nerves. She was trembling violently, but he could not let pass the imputation of nightmare, so his answer was strictly to the point. The woman must have gone by some secret door. Both doors of my chamber were locked, and she could hardly have escaped by a window. Have you never heard of a secret passage to that room, Lady Ursula? Oh, I have heard some servants gossip of there being secret passages here. There are in most old houses, she murmured vaguely. But I have never felt interested in them. It is my belief that they were stopped up years ago. At this juncture, Mr. Clavering suddenly darted to the outer door and peered through the dripping glass. Did he hear above the howling of the wind through the garden spaces the sound of carriage wheels on the driveway, or was it merely fancy? The darkness was impenetrable now that the lightning has ceased. "'What is the matter now, Mr. Clavering?' demanded Lady Ursula nervously. "'You are positively uncanny to-night.' "'I thought the storm was coming back,' he prevaricated, and wondered at himself for doing so. "'Why, the storm is passing off. I hope it is passing off,' she added, with a curious earnestness. She, too, seemed to be listening to something outside. "'Mr. Clavering,' she asked abruptly, "'I don't suppose you could describe this woman, whom you say came into your chamber, vanished in some mysterious fashion, and later went out through the garden door?' In a general way, I could. I saw her quite distinctly in a flash of lightning. The candle shook in Lady Ursula's hand. You think you would recognize her if you should see her again? It is possible I might, he answered after reflection, wondering at the intensity with which the question was put. The woman was tall, very tall, and of masculine build. I should say she was a gypsy. A gypsy would hardly have the keys to the manor, she demurred. You may as well confess, Mr. Clavering, with a pitiful attempt at raillery, that you had the nightmare and dreamed it all. I can only repeat that everything has occurred precisely as I have related it, he answered in his stiffest manner. She gave an impatient little shrug. It is a very wild tale. I beg that you will not mention it to anyone else. If Lady Pevensey should hear of it, nothing would induce her to remain another day, and I cannot be left alone now. She looked so distressed that Mr. Clavering was heartily ashamed of himself for the lack of consideration he had shown her. 
and after offering apologies for having alarmed her with the story, promised that no mention of it should pass his lips again. She appeared relieved at this, and wishing him a good night, turned to ascend the circular stairs. "'I shall not even make inquiries among the servants,' she said lightly. "'You see the absurdity of it all. A gypsy provided with keys to the manor?' He admitted the absurdity, but not the nightmare, and returned to his chamber, perplexed and ill-disposed to sleep. He succeeded in discovering the matches, and spent the remainder of the night in vain search for a secret door. Lady Ursula had not shaken his conviction that there was one. He had breakfast with Lord Meldrum and Elsie Baring. The latter was pale and seemed on the verge of tears. Her feverish questioning as to the whereabouts of Robert Sylvester showed why the tragedy had taken such hold upon the light-hearted and insouciant girl. But Meldrum could give her no satisfaction. Robert Sylvester had completely vanished from the knowledge of his acquaintances. Her persistent and pointed questioning, however, finally wrung from Meldrum the reluctant admission that Robert was no longer to be sought for at the country club. He had been debarred from there on account of a brawl in which he had been the chief participator. "'When did this occur?' asked Elsie with quivering lip. "'Tuesday night,' answered Meldrum regretfully. She shivered. Tuesday was the night of the murder. "'At what time?' she persisted. "'Please do not keep anything back from me. It is best that I know all.' Lord Meldrum gave her a look of deep sympathy as he replied gravely. The quarrel took place about eleven o'clock. Robert had been in a sullen mood from the time of his coming there, and the taunts of a man named Belmont, to whom he owed money, roused him to fury. He violently assaulted Belmont, and other members of the club were obliged to separate them. Robert was forcibly ejected, and has not been seen since. Elsie rose, trembling. Lord Meldrum, she begged, tears in her eyes, do not let that detective know of this. He is determined to fasten this crime on Robert, but but I will not believe him guilty. Burton shall learn nothing from me, Meldrum assured her, but if he makes inquiries at the club, he will surely be told. Don't you think you are making too much of this quarrel? After all, it proves nothing against Robert. It proves, she answered white-faced, that he did not go to London that night, and that he might have returned here. Meldrum was silent. "'But if he did return here,' she went on hysterically, "'it was not to kill his brother. I know it was not. Oh, say that you know it, too,' she pleaded. Meldrum appeared genuinely distressed. "'I don't think that there's any real vindictiveness in Robert,' he evaded. The half-heartedness of his reply enraged the distraught girl. "'I do not see why all suspicion should fall on Robert,' she cried. "'You as well as he were far from being on friendly terms with Lord Portstead that night.' and as the secretary asked what were you doing in the gardens at that hour of the night the shot told meldrum compressed his lips and a forbidding expression crossed his face what i was doing in the gardens miss baring is solely my affair he answered coldly elsie baring's girlish face grew hard and distrustful i think lord meldrum she said slowly and deliberately that you know more about the murder than you wish to admit with that she left the room her young figure uncompromisingly erect. For a moment Meldrum sat staring after her, as though not comprehending the full significance of her words. Then horror dawned in his eyes, and he turned with quick appeal to Mr. Clavering, who had been a silent and amazed witness of the scene. "'Clavering, old fellow,' pleaded Meldrum, with a trace of his ingratiating boyish smile. "'You don't believe I had any hand in Portstead's death, do you?' Mr. Clavering twisted uncomfortably on his chair. The conscientious honesty of his nature had often caused him distress, but never more so than now. In Meldrum's presence it was impossible to believe harm of the big, boyish, lovable man, and yet so many of his actions were inexplicable and even suspicious. Meldrum noticed his hesitancy. "'By Jove, Clavering, you don't think—' "'I think,' Mr. Clavering hastily interposed, "'that you ought to explain what you were doing in the gardens at two o'clock in the morning.' Again Meldrum compressed his lips, and his eyes grew severe and determined. "'I cannot explain.' "'I am sorry,' was all Mr. Clavering could manage to utter. At that moment Harry Brooks came precipitately into the room. At sight of Meldrum his face darkened, and he turned to withdraw. "'I hope you will pardon me, Mr. Clavering,' he said stiffly. "'But I understood that you had finished your breakfast. I came here for mine, at Lady Ursula's request, in order to save the servants trouble at this most distressing time.' 
His small, vindictive eyes were fastened on Meldrum as he said this. Meldrum advanced toward him. "'Brooks,' he said frankly, "'I take it we both lost our heads a bit the other night. Shall we shake hands and forswear hard feelings?' Smiling, he held out his hand. Brooks flushed darkly. "'I do not care to shake hands with you, Lord Meldrum,' he replied pointedly. Mr. Clavering expected to see fire flash in Meldrum's eyes, but instead a pained expression came into them. "'You misjudge me, Brooks,' was all he said, and quietly walked from the room. End of chapter 9「Ten of that affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mavis. Mr. Clavering had made up his mind to investigate the near and dense woods which the windows of his chamber looked out upon, and he decided that no time could be better than this morning, when every one seemed occupied with their own concerns. The day was of that cool freshness which so often follows a severe storm. There was just wind enough to dry the pools of rainwater, and the sky was washed a bright, cloudless blue, altogether an ideal day for walking. Before starting out, however, he carried up to Lady Pevensey's room a primly exquisite bouquet of roses from the gardens. He impressed upon her elderly maid, Parkins, the fact that each flower had been picked by his own hands. Possibly this delicate attention affected Lady Pevensey. Possibly she was becoming weary of her own society. However it was, she consented to come to the door and thank him in person. As he was the first male creature to whom she had shown her face since Tuesday night, he felt properly flattered, and even went so far as to hint that he had a fairly definite clue as to the hiding place of the thief and murderer. "'Well, whatever comes of it,' observed Lady Pevensey, none too encouragingly, "'you can't do much worse than that detective fellow, and he hasn't done anything.' Mr. Clavering rather bridled at this, and abruptly set off for the woods, resolved to prove to Lady Pevensey that it was possible for a careful student of detective methods to succeed where a professional had apparently failed. Emerging from the spacious park encircling the manor on all sides, he saw that a direct route to the woods must lead him across a somewhat spongy-looking meadow, but a few steps therein soon convinced him that the longest way around would be the most advisable, if he wished to preserve the immaculateness of his patent leathers and delicate fawn-colored gaiters. Accordingly, he took to the road, a branch of which dipped and wound to the entrance of the woods. As he walked along the sweet-smelling lane, now and again flecking at the high-waving bracken with his silver-topped cane, he was conscious of a thrill of expectation. What secret might not these tall, dark woods contain? Was it not probable that he should meet there the evil genius of Portstead Manor? His British stolidity, strangely shaken, he involuntarily tightened his grip upon his cane and walked on with grim resolution. Suddenly, from behind, came the rattle of wheels, the clatter of hoofs, and shrill, eager cries. He turned hastily and saw dashing toward him, out of the distance, a sturdy little foam-drenched Shetland pony, dragging a low dog-cart, jolting and jerking and swaying after him. Leaning out over the mad little beast of a pony and vigorously belaboring him with a long-tailed lash, was a small girl of eleven or twelve years, with a flying mass of red-gold hair and a sharp, elfish face. A gypsy-like woman, the other occupant of the lurching dog-cart, was endeavoring to check the ardor of the fiery little charioteer, who only redoubled her lashings and shrill cries of, "'Faster, Tony! Faster!' All this Mr. Clavering noticed as the dog-cart plunged upon him and flashed by. A moment more, and it came to a violent halt, the pony rearing upon his haunches, and the child almost thrown from the wagon. A man, tall and thin and roughly clad, had darted out from the woods and, seizing the pony's bridle, was threatening the woman and child. The child was striking at him with the whip like a little fury, and the woman's voice, loud, passionate, and vibrating with fierce, foreign imprecations, was borne back on the wind. Fired by the cowardice of the attack, Mr. Clavering ran toward the dog-cart, shouting to the man to loose the bridle. His shouts were unheard or unheeded until he was within a few feet, when the man, giving him a startled stare, unexpectedly loosed the bridle and plunged back into the woods. Now there was really more of the ludicrous than of the formidable in the appearance of Mr. Clavering. Short, rotund, perspiring and breathless, feebly brandishing his cane, yet the fact remained that the man fled at the sight of him. 
Mr. Clavering had time only to observe that he wore a full dark beard and that there was something vaguely familiar about him. Left thus in possession of the field, it was only natural that he should, with somewhat of a conqueror's air, assure the woman and child that they need have no further fear, for he would continue to protect them. Fear! Corporal de Bacco! ejaculated the woman, with a withering glance at her panting knight. I have not fear. I need not protection. Only for the signorina. I should have jumped down and beaten him. I, myself. You should see. I am strong. He has fear of me. Mr. Clavering was about to give the woman a fitting rebuke for her lack of gratitude, but his words died away in amazement as he studied the dark, passion-flushed face. He knew her, knew her for the woman whom he had seen in the lightning's flare the night before in the library at Portstead Manor. Fiercely she resented his stare, and snatching the reins from the child, jerked the pony about. The action roused the child, who had sat huddled in a sort of stupor since their assailant's disappearance. "'Stop, Elena!' she commanded shrilly, laying a thin, imperious little hand upon the reins. "'I wish to thank the man. Whoa, Tony!' The woman, sullenly submissive, relinquished the reins, and the child, with a smile that transformed her shrewish little face, extended her hand to Mr. Clavering. "'Thank you,' she said earnestly. "'Elena is a savage. She does not know. Please, what is your name?' As Mr. Clavering gravely informed her, the woman suddenly snatched up the reins again and gave the pony a cruel crack of the whip. As the dog-cart lurched forward, the child screamed in angry protest, but there was no stopping Tony now. Head in air, bit between teeth, he whirled and dashed and galloped, the dog-cart rocking perilously from side to side, now on the road, now off, now through the trees upon the greensward, now back again upon the road. At the risk of her neck, the child leaned out. "'My name is Mavis,' she called. What else she said was drowned in the clatter of Tony's hoofs and the cracking of the whip wielded by Elena. "'I live at Wild Rose Villa,' shrilled the child defiantly, and then the plunging wagonette and the red-haired little fury and the mysterious Elena were lost in the distance. Mr. Clavering, being the most methodical of men, always carried about with him a small memorandum book in which he jotted down, under alphabetical headings, whatever he might need for future reference. He now carefully inscribed therein, Mavis, Wild Rose Villa. End of chapter 10